This is Bill King, and this is Conversations in All Keys at the Redwood Theater, and welcome in. And my special guest today is Lou Pomonte. Hey, Bill. In a lengthy career as a composer, producer, musician, Gemini Award winner and five-time nominee, Lou Pomonte has amassed credits in scoring, songwriting, producing, and performing on hundreds of musical projects from film, television, and albums. He's toured with Blood, Sweat, and Tears, um, Platinum Blonde, we're going to find out what the, what you did there. Yep. Triumph, Jeff Healy, Kim Mitchell, and a long stay with Michael Bublé yep. and producing and writing some of his hits. Welcome in, Lou. Hey, man. You know this room well. Yes, I know this room well. <laughs> I love this room. You had an Oakland Stroke here. I had two, Oak, three Oakland Stroke shows here, one private and two public shows. Yeah, and they went really And well. I love it. I love yeah. this. It reminds yeah. me, you know, my band is Oakland Stroke, named after Tower Power, of course, who grew up in Oakland. And there was a club in Oakland that they played in when they were coming up and they were no, nobodies. And the way that Mimi describes that club is just like this Just like club. this, yeah. Just like but this. But this is how they look then. With the old, you know, with the yeah. distressed brick. It's an old building. It's over 100 years old. It's got vibe to it. It's great. I, I, I love it here. You know, it was great because I remember the first time I got you to walk in here. Yeah. And it was, uh, I think, probably February. Yeah. And you look and you went, oh, my God. <laughs> this is in my neighborhood, too. Ten minutes from my house, yeah, yeah. and I said, the minute I walked in here, I said, I got to bring Tim Notter down here. Yeah, because Because I thought, this is the new Orbit Room. Yeah, and it is. It's yeah. worked out great for everybody. Yeah. Um, I was, I was uh, reading some of your posts over the holidays, and you got about, I don't know, 300 pages into Barbara Streisand's. Uh, <sighs> I'm about halfway through, which is about 600 pages. <laughs> yeah. I love Babs. <laughs> This is, but it's a lot. It's, it's every detail. <laughs> it's a lot. It's every, well, it's every outfit she wore and yeah, all isn't that, that kind of stuff. Isn't that wild? I tend to, you know, maybe gloss over that, yeah. the, the outfit parts. Yeah. But I'm a, I, I love her yeah. so much. I didn't always love her. Um, there was a time when, in my younger days, when I was more fusion-oriented and maybe more jazz-oriented, that I found her vibrato a little much and maybe the showy musical theater aspect of her singing too much, but that went away when I married my wife and my wife was a big Barbara Streisand fan. And now when I hear her sing, I, I mean, it's, I'm getting goosebumps thinking about her singing. Well, this, this sort of brings us to the fact that you've worked with, recorded many singers, produced them, and they don't come fully formed. Yeah. And when you read this book yeah. and you read about the 15, 19, 17, 18, 19 year yeah. old, and a singer that absolutely absolutely refuses to take lessons, Yeah, doesn't need them, just yeah. sings. Never because, had a lesson. Because she's got records. Uh, she goes, she spends her entire uh, teens in the theater. Yeah. So she, her repertoire is not and influenced. And she considers herself an actress first, and uh, yeah. she's an actress who also sings. Yeah. And that reminds me of the famous quote from a friend of mine, who is, which is, whatever you think of yourself is none of your business. In other words, the public or the industry will tell you what they want from you and what they need from you and what you're good at. It's fine for Barbara to think she's an actress first and a singer second. Mm -hmm. She's not. She's one of the most iconic singers in history, of, certainly of the 20th century, right up there with Frank Sinatra and Tony Bennett and all those people and, and Aretha and Ray and all those people in, in, a, in a different genre. So it doesn't matter that she thinks of herself as an actress first because she is a singer who also acts. I, so I hate it, to break it to her. No, no, uh, but I think the point was that having that background in theater as an actress, then you inhabit a song. Mm. And her choices of material- it definitely helps she her. She was not influenced yeah. by the great American songbook. Right. She just heard songs that stuck with her. Yeah. And she sung them over and over and over and yeah. over and over and over. Yeah. I mean, as she grew older, she still sang them yeah. until she recorded them. Yeah. And they kept, changing and evolving, but she also had a, a great arranger and keyboardist from the beginning, yeah. and then she had the amazing... She had many great arrangers, well, Peter Matz Peter and Matz Marvin Hamlish and all these guys, you know. So it's beautiful to see that, so you're working with singers all the time. I am. What goes through your head? You're, 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 gonna, you're gonna evaluate this because the singer comes to you and expects results. Right. You have to evaluate where the singer can go, because there's limitations and then there's the stretch. Well, look, uh, take, my, uh, take my solo album that came out about a year and a half ago. Okay. It's called Lou Pamonti in France. So I wanted to do a second solo album. 
So what do I do? I do what I think I'm good at, and that is I have my friends come in, my favorite singers that I know, come in and guess with me, and I craft the arrangement and the production around that singer and try to make them sound as good as I can possibly make them sound. So I think the process is, I mean, if you don't know the person and they come out of the blue, like you have to listen and you have to see, you, you have to find out what they're good at, you have to find out what they're bad at. Okay. And you gotta accentuate the positive, I mean, obviously. And I try to wrap them in beautiful arrangements. There are some singers that just wants piano, mm -hmm. but then there's some singers that just, you know, you want to put everything around them, the strings and the woodwinds and everybody. You know. There is a situation, though, when a singer comes in fresh to you, uh, many of them carry things with them that have to be eliminated yeah. to get to the core of the voice. Sure. This is where your psychiatrist. Yeah. Well, as a You're producer, right. we're part psychiatrists, right? <laughs> you have shrink. to, in part some shrink. way, figure, look at each person differently yeah. and how you approach it so they don't say, I'm out of here because this is what I do and this is who I am. Right. That's, that's a struggle sometimes. Yeah, well, you work with lots of singers. Yeah, I know. Yeah, is, so, I, I mean, uh, look, every pro the, the most important thing, and I tell this to young guys, the most important thing is that every project is different. There are the projects where, say, a female singer will come in, or a male singer, it, do, it doesn't matter, and you'll talk about the arrangement, and then they'll go away, I'll craft the entire track by myself without her, their input. Mm -hmm. They'll come in and sing for two hours, I'll get them to sing it eight or ten times. Okay, see you later, and I send them the final, I send them the, the final master. Then there are the singers who want to be involved and are creative people and who want to be involved at every step of the process. And that's a whole different scene as opposed to you just being hired to right. wrap them in beautiful uh, wrapping paper, right? It's, uh, you consider yourself an accompanist. Yeah, oh yeah, there was that article, wasn't there? I read there? that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, I think I am because even though I have solo records, I'm rarely at the forefront of the tracks. Right. It's more like I'm trying to highlight the instrumentalist or the singer. Like I have Randy Brecker play on a lot of my tracks over the last three or four years. He was introduced to me by a mutual friend and I think he's played, you know, whether it's my solo stuff, Robin Black or Mark Jordan, he's probably played on 12 tracks for me. And, and, and wrapping him in a beautiful bow, him being one of my childhood idols and one of the greatest soloists of all time. Just you let know. them go. It's just, yeah. you just do your thing, Randy and I'll wrap it for you. I, I always thought the same thing because I used uh, uh, frequently uh, Mike Merley. Yeah, and, who I love, who's William Mark's record too. William, yeah. William's Brandy. And Beautiful soloist, great yeah. soloist. And that's what, the, and then I just got out of the way. I just did the arranging and, and the tracks, reduced yeah. it, but yeah. I find that sometimes outside of what we do, there are people who just are very uh, capable yeah. of going places that we can't go, we exactly, don't go. or even thought of. A thought of. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. And you go, oh my God. Well, that's why, do? you know, that's why comping is such an important part of that's record it. production these days. Yeah. You know, like when I work with Robin Black or Will or Mike or Randy, it's like three, four tracks. Okay, great. Be they're all great. They are. And then I let a day go by so that I don't, so I'm not fresh with what just happened come back the following day and comp it. And I may use, you know, first two lines from track one, second two lines from track yeah. two, because you're looking for gems. That's why a guy like Kevin Bright has had such a good session career, because he's gonna give you stuff. You've never heard of. You've, you've never, never thought of. <laughs> <laughs> Some stuff you don't want, you but that's walk. okay, because yeah. he's, he's gonna give you a little bit of magic. It's angular. He's gonna give you a little bit of yeah. magic that yeah. nobody else can give you, and that's, what producers are looking for, and you, right? And you stop on the playback and you go, what just happened? Yeah, what's that? And then you go, how does it really fit in the context of everything? And usually it works. Uh, I liked it because with Kevin Bright, there are like five, six, seven uh, different kinds of guitar, yes. string instruments right. on the floor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he goes, oh, I think I'll add this. And right. you go, well, I was even Right, I, did, I, I thought, I thought we were done. Yeah. <laughs> I thought you we were yeah. done. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, 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 you know, in my older age, I am such a fan of YouTube, and I travel the world uh, looking at pianists. 
uh, of every stripe. I don't know if you do that now, but I will. It, it's, it's opened up this uh, continuous uh, flow of you know, Art Tatum oh, and, yeah. and Oscar we see all the yeah. time. But then you get the classical side, then you get into this side, and it's on and on, and, and you know, the algorithm will keep feeding you. Yep. And then you get into piano technique stuff. Yeah. Then you get into breaking down things or, or, or things that can really yeah. help your playing. Yeah. And then you get in things as simple as uh, just playing a note on the piano and going, oh, God, I'm lost. You know, when you, when you hear some of the teaching and some of the early education, they're talking about, you know, as pianists, we would play hand in a certain yeah. way, the exercises. And all of a sudden, hand in, in the world of, of these incredible teachers is a single note, a certain style, the thumb forward, and this. Yeah. You had some of this teaching yourself on piano, or do you look at this and go, oh, God, can I reassess some of the things I'm doing? I'm a student of YouTube U University yeah. ever since it started, but yeah. most... Most, uh, the most important thing that's happened to me with YouTube in the last eight years is I've learned how to mix. Okay. I'm now a mixer. I mix all my own records. I mix yeah, all yeah. my solo records. I mix all Robin's records. I mix the John Finley record. And it, it like mixing is daunting. Yes. For guys that came yeah. up when we came up, mm -hmm. it's like, the engineers and the board were like, okay, you musicians, you stay away from that board now. That's, that's way above <laughs> but, your but head. But we were next to the board all that, the time. That's right, but don't, that don't. <laughs> did I ever touch a knob no. at the 400 sessions I did at Manta? No. I wouldn't have dreamed of it. So it's a, it's, it was like a leap of faith. But I was going, it's all there on YouTube. And even though there may be some engineer out there who's technically better at the technical aspects of mixing, how is he going to compete with my 50 years of musical experience? He can't. He can't. <laughs> but I am going to have a perspective on that mix that only someone who's been in the business and had the experiences that yeah. I've had, which is only me, yeah. uh, is going to bring to that record. So I've learned that maybe even though some of my mixes, you know, hey, Lou, there's a little bit too much two, two, 250 in that mix. Well. Yeah. I'm hoping the mastering engineer is <laughs> going to catch that. Yeah. And, and, but, but listen to the musicality of the mix. And so I've learned to trust myself and just go for it. Now, on your mixes, uh, you go from headphones to uh, do you listen to a variety of set settings? Or will you listen to, through different headphones and then listen there and then keep going back and going, oh, God. Well, what I do is I've got my, my main setup okay. in my studio. And I, you know, I've got my speakers and I have a sub. And then when I need to check things, I bought the Slate VSX system for okay. headphones, which emulates different rooms okay. in all over the world, different mixing rooms or in your car. So it's kind of, uh, that's my B room check is to go to, to the VSX phones. So I can listen to Stephen Slate's room in LA or I can listen to Howie wow. Weinberg's room in New York City or what, whatever. So that's very good. It beats running out to your car in the middle of winter and listening to- <laughs> And the car is the amphitheater, <laughs> yeah. man. Right, you know. It's the so, best place to listen yeah, to yeah, the world. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, that's great. Yeah. Uh, where were you born? Here. For, for, but what, what, what? region of the city? I was born in the northwest end uh, in Weston at uh, in Weston. Weston Road and Shepherd. Okay. And well, actually, I was born in Little, Little Italy at Kiel and St. Clair, but we moved when I was a couple of years old up to the west end. So I grew up in the west end. Uh, who, who dragged you into the music thing? Okay. So it's funny. There is no musicality in my extended None? family. None. Zero. Um, there's a rumor about my uncle Guido being singing with big bands, but nobody's got a picture to back it up or anything. Did you do the DA ancestry? Yeah, yeah, I did. But um, uh, no, there was no musicality at all. And I've got two older sisters, and my, my father forced them to take uh, piano lessons when they were young. They both took piano lessons for six years and ended up at grade three and could barely play. So they gave up, and I was number three. And I discovered the piano in our basement that was still there that was given to us by my aunt rose and uh i started plunking out myself when i was 12 years old and uh my dad came up to me and said do you want to take lessons i said no he goes i'll do you he says i'll make you a deal take six lessons and if you want to quit you can quit i'll never mention it to you again i said okay as long as i don't have to take classical <laughs> so i go to um What's it called? Uh, Rose Music Center in right. downtown Weston. Okay. 
And I was 12 years old, and I got it. They gave me an 18-year-old teacher who, guess who it was? It was Glenn Morley. Oh, my goodness. So was when I was 12, 18-year-old yeah. Glenn was my first music teacher. That's fantastic. Isn't that great? Yeah. And we did, uh, we did six months with Glenn, and I switched and went to the Royal Conservatory and studied classical for the next six years. Really? Yeah, and, and then I went to Humber. Daily. I mean, you were in there every week. I was practicing... I was practicing six to eight hours a day all through my teens. Yeah, and then when you went to Humber, you got the training and when I went to Humber, I stopped the Royal Conservatory because they were like right, right. they were like right. one would say black, one would say white. Right, right, right. So I cut out the conservatory, which I'd had enough of anyways. And then believe you, me, I'm no classical pianist. But but the thing was to have that touch and to have those are the things where you develop right. all the and the sight reading the, really the helps. sight reading really does. Yeah, uh, the composition and arranging skills. This is stuff you developed at Humber. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And uh, Petra, but I'm you, telling you, you I think when I first started getting busy in the studio session in 1983, when I was 25. I think one of the things, there was obviously, it's never one thing, but I think one of the things that cemented it was they couldn't throw anything at me that I couldn't sight, sight read. Yeah. I had been reading Debussy and Ravel yeah. and Mozart and Beethoven, even though I was playing them badly by classical standards, oh, yeah, yeah. I could still read them. So, I mean, to, to get a part at a session for a jingle or a TV, or a TV show or a record just, or whatever. Yeah, they were pretty easy. But, but I found out one of the things I really loved as a kid was go to the library and get the scores. Oh, I never did that. I got the records, but I never got the scores the until scores. I was in college. Yeah, I would have yeah. Be Be Beethoven. And follow the score. Follow the score. Fantastic. And then work the way up to Stravinsky. Yeah. And then, you know, you follow. The only thing I lines. couldn't yeah. understand with those classical dudes, man, and I still can't <laughs> understand is why they read a transpose score. Why don't they use a concert score? Because, you know... Yeah, yeah, you're, yeah. You're, you're like me. Yeah. If you're following along, yeah. I don't want to have to transpose the trumpet note. No, no, no. Or the, or the, or the bass clarinet note. Yeah. I want to see what the pitch is, not their pitch. Yeah. Right? So I found that very fr frustrating. Now, was there a ranger uh, of anyone who said, oh, God, everything he does voices, he voices it beautifully. He gets the violins, he gets the strings, he gets the horns. They're in the right register. They're... Uh, the, where, they, where their harmonic right. parts are together, it's just beyond anything I can understand. Johnny Mandel. Johnny Mandel. Absolutely. Number one. Right. Absolutely. I get goosebumps talking about that. Yeah, guy. Yeah. He just died a couple of years ago. Yeah. That guy, I mean, here's to life, that, that arrangement yes. for Shirley Horn. Unbelievable. Uh, anything that has to do with the shadow of your smile, which Johnny wrote, um, uh, just his, uh, his the gooshiness yeah. Of of that richness of those voicings and the strings and the lower strings and stuff like that. It's just beautiful. David Foster says the same thing. Yeah, and those are those are the rare ones, aren't they? Oh, they, Pete Rugolo. Yes, yeah. Um, Peter Mans Ralph too. Burns. You Peter Mans did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because you know, I'm 15 or 16. I'm li listening to Peter Mans, and I don't know it. Right. With the Streisand records. Exactly. You know, and you're, exactly. And you're going. To, this is how this is built yeah. up so beautifully. Yeah. Um, now you're in this time of your life. You went through. You had this uh, great run with Michael Bu Bublé. Yeah. Uh, a couple of hit records there. Uh, his biggest hit. His biggest hit. Yeah. yeah. And so now you're having fun with your own band, Oakland Stroke. Yeah. Your other projects that you're doing, your uh, soul review yeah. kind of thing. Um, what's on your mind? Well, I decided. I'm 65 now. I decided in my late 50s, it was time to stop worrying about money. Mm -hmm. I had had a good enough career that money wasn't really an issue. Like I've had no problem making my mortgage or anything like that. Mm -hmm. So I didn't really have to get up and work. But, but what I wanted to do is I had spent a lifetime, you know, working on other people's music, you know, playing sessions, whether it's jingles, records, or TV shows, uh, writing jingles for 15 years. Um, I was always the behind the scenes guy. And so I thought, but yet, by the time I was 55, I didn't have a whole lot that I could hold up and say, so what have you done in your life, yeah, where's Lou? the inventory? Well, <laughs> you can listen to this record, but it's by an, a different artist. And this sold a lot of records. Yeah. But it's not really me. It's yeah. me contributing to this record, right? Um, so I thought, well, let's see what you got. 
like I said to myself. So let's see what you got. And so I started, and it was very gratifying, and I got a lot of reaction. No money, of course, yeah. but a lot of positive feedback. And, um, and so the question becomes, how good am I? How good can I get? Yeah. How much... How good is the music that I make when I compare it to my idols? Not to, not to the people around you, but, but to, to the very top level of what you aspire to as a kid, the Gino Vanellis or the Earth, Wind and Fires or all you know, Herbies and Chicks yeah, yeah, and all yeah. those guys, you know? It's like, how does it stand up? And it's hard, right? It gets harder too. Well. Because you listen more yeah. and you go, oh my God. Yeah. You know, uh, well, some some of it's inspired. Like some is art and some is craft, right? I, I was listening to this classical pianist the other day. I, I think it was Peter Hamlin or something. I can't remember his name, but he says uh, we're going to look at the five hardest pieces of music ever made. Mm. And I for listened, piano? Yeah, for piano. I just, rock too. I, I left the house. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Right. Yeah. <laughs> it's good to do that. But that's what, when oh, I was a teenager God. going to see Oscar Peterson at the Ontario Place Forum, yeah. I would have this, this push and pull of, oh my God, that's the most fantastic thing in the world. I love it. Yeah. And the other side was, I will never play yeah. like that. And I know in my heart and soul that I will never play like that. And so it's, it's elevating and it was depressing as, as a young kid. But then... Now you understand that you find your own voice. It's exactly. just about your and voice. And of course, I'm not and with, Peters, within everything that you've you know, learned and you yeah, do. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, great time in life. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I get to indulge myself. <laughs> hey, listen to this. My my wife, my poor wife. Yeah. Right. Did you hey, do honey, this to her? Hey, honey, come on down and listen to this. Right. <laughs> I won't even do that it's anymore. Like, it's great. It's great. It's yeah. great. Yeah. So anyway, yeah. Uh, I feel sorry for her. You know, it all started with that relationship with the keyboard, with the piano. Uh, you like to play solo piano, sit down do. and play. Uh, what do you feel when you play solo piano and you're by yourself? When I was younger, I used to improvise at the piano all the time. Yeah. I found it very freeing to just absolutely not improvise to a tune, just improvise from zero, just the way that Herbie and Chick used to do that. And I found it incredibly freeing. Mm -hmm. I don't really do that anymore. What I do now is now I'm really looking at how can I make an arrangement mm -hmm. of a song that's unique to me. So when I do my, my jazz gigs now, there's, there's uh, two songs that I always do solo. I do Lush Life, which I've worked up my own arrangement of Lush right. Life, and also God Only Knows by Brian Wilson, which I absolutely is a masterpiece of a song. And I play them differently every time. So that's my outlet for solo piano right now. And I'm, I'd, I'd, what I would love to do is I would love to have an hour of solo piano that's worked out yeah. with set arrangements you, 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 that I can improvise within, right. but that I have set out because I, I think that would be a gas. It's good stuff. Yeah. So you've got some projects going on on the move. I do. And let's start with one first. Anyone in particular Anyone you'd like particular. to start with? Yeah. Well, um, I just released uh, a joint solo record with Robin Black, and it's uh, okay. Robin Black and Lou Pamonti, and the album's called Butterfly. Mm -hmm. And um, that's been a labor of love. You know, I finally met a singer that uh, I don't charge a cent to. <laughs> okay. It's just she's my collaborator. Yeah. Yes. We write together. I find her voice uplifting. She gives me goosebumps every single time. And she's one of those intuitive singers that, uh, that I just, I'm always amazed. It's like, turn the mic on and shut up and just let her go, you yeah. know, just like you were saying. So we have a album release party coming out February the 15th at Dundas 3030. I would have had it here, but we were forced into having it in the West End. So I understand. Yeah. 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 It's, it's foreign territory over there. <laughs> I don't like crossing <laughs> Young Street, <laughs> Bill. <laughs> that's, been, that's been something. Toronto I, is two cities now, right? Yeah, but I think something that COVID told us that a lot of those venues are gone, so you're going to have to go wherever there's a venue. Right, right. You know, right. And I think we will see more of that. Yeah. So that, that's great. And to have those kind of relationships and to do that, you're absolutely right. I wish I had met her 20 years ago, but of course she would have been 15. Right. So that, but that wouldn't have worked How many 15-year-olds? We've all worked with 15, 16, 17-year-olds <laughs> yeah, in right. our lifetime. Other projects. 
Oh my gosh. Um, I've, I've been doing a lot of sessions at the house. I've been doing a lot of string and horn writing for artists all over the world. I just finished one in Prague. and um, I just did an interesting project that you'll be interested in. He's a smooth jazz artist out of Nashville. His name's Les Sabler. But that wasn't the interesting thing about it. He called me after I produced a couple of songs for him and said, uh, would you mind putting together my book for me, my horn book? Because um, uh, it's kind of all over the place and it needs someone right. to you know, consolidate it and make it right. He says, I'll send you the original scores and you can make the book out of them. Well, he sends me the original scores and six of the tunes are by Jerry Hay. Okay. Uh, for yeah, all, yeah, for yeah. you folks that don't know who, you know who Jerry yeah. Hay is, but Jerry Hay is one of the best small band horn arrangers of all time, mm -hmm. from Sea Wind, everything from Michael Jackson, Thriller, to everything. So you never know. See, if I had said no to that job, if I had said, ah, I'm too busy, I don't really care, I've never heard of the guy, you know, blah, 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 um, I would have never been in, in, in possession of these six original Jerry Hay scores. And... I'm looking at this and I'm real I'm learning I'm learning more in an hour of looking at these Jerry Hay scores than any teacher ever taught me in any school. And this is the position I've of ever went where to. the horns what horns are on top of them. You know, it's written in his hand, okay? okay. Yeah, he doesn't yeah. use uh, notation software. So yeah. it's him, pencil, and it's photocopies of his pencil scores. And it's like one thing I didn't know that he did, which was totally interesting was let's say he's got a four piece or a five piece horn section that he has to deal with mm -hmm. for this thing. Well, it'll be four piece, four piece, four piece until he gets to the chorus and he wants a bigger sound. Well, he writes seven piece or he writes nine piece or he writes okay. six piece or seven piece. Then he goes back to the four and he doesn't care. He just gets the guys to overdub. And it's funny, I had always had in my mind. Keep the four going. I got a four-piece horn section. I'm <laughs> going to write four-part. I'm going to write four-part harmony all through. And it's like, well, no, that he doesn't do that. Um, it, it's so funny. Um, that's great, though. It's interesting, that's and really of course, good. that's how, like on Steely Dan records, when Tom Scott, you know, mm -hmm. arranged all the horns for the great Steely Dan records, he did that too. I only now realize where it might yeah. be two horns starting, and then as it grows, he adds a third and a fourth and a fifth and a sixth and a seventh until he finally gets that sound that he wants. Yeah. Um, but once again, social media. So I look at his scores and they're in transposed, which makes no sense because pop guys use concert score. That's Classical right. guys use transposed score, That's right? right. Um, so I'm friends with Jerry Hay on Facebook. So I figure I'm gonna send Jerry Hay a private message. Hey Jerry, I'm working with Les blah, blah, blah. And I can't believe you were, Jerry gets right back to me and explains to me why he uses transpose score and all this stuff. And it's just, uh, I, I, I mean, no matter what the talk about music is or whatever questions anybody asks me, it always gets back to arranging. Yeah, it does. Did you ever hear what Burt Bacharach said about his work? No. He said, he said, I'm a composer and arranger and a piano player and I'm all these things. And he says, I get joy out of all of them. He says, but the thing that I get the biggest kick out of more than the songwriting is when I write an arrangement for orchestra and I stand up on the podium for the first time and I count one, two, three, four, and they start playing and, they, and I get to hear my arrangement. Yeah, that would just. That's Arranging just, is a thing that people fantastic. who don't do it, yeah. they don't understand. Well, first of all, the power. Mm -hmm. You're telling everybody exactly what to play. Like it's not a jazz group, right? If you're writing an orchestral arrangement or a horn, I mean, these guys are playing exactly what you wrote. Yeah. So it's a bit of a power trip too. Yeah. A bit of an ego boost if it sounds good. <laughs> if it doesn't sound any good, you want to slit, 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 slit your wrists. But I was watched uh, the interview with the guy that was um, Leonard Bernstein's assist yeah. assistant. Did you watch this? Have you seen this? Oh yeah. No, I, I, okay. no, I saw the movie. This is, okay. This is a one where he's talking about, uh, Bernstein did that, um, redid the West Side Story in 82 or 84. German company came along, Duchess Gramophone said, okay, we want you, we're going to give you the money and you go record it with opera singers. Go record it oh. with the best singers. Redo it all and oh. we'll pay for it. So uh, his assistant had to get the original scores from the 50s, right? And take them in. He said, go get the scores. Well, he gets the scores. And there were hundreds of wrong notes. 
Really? Hundreds of changes it had to make. And, and he, was, he talks about how he had to go page to page and make corrections, right? Because on the originals, when they, went, they were thought of as just one-offs. So when you went in the studio, this was the part, so you make the correction in right, there, right, and right. you blot this out. Oh, I well, see. Well, this is, so when you go back in the archives and you get this stuff, you don't know where you're going with so you had to go page by page by page oh. through the, the whole score and make those corrections and then go to him and go, are we sure this is the note? So they're all marked up. And they're all marked yeah, up, yeah, 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 and to do stuff like that. And I, I just know, just I have the book, the, the West, I just still think West Side Story is the greatest. Oh, unbelievable. But just to sit with the book and in the keys that are we're in yeah. and just look at it as a keyboard player and play through it and look at it, it's just marvelous. It is, it's, to un hear the it's chords. unbelievable. And so the last question I have is, is when you get in a rut like this, um, uh, and am you get I in a rut? No, no. When, whenever you get in a rut like this, do you find sometimes it's, it's great just to go and, and find another composer or a classical composer and just look at their music and look at the architecture yes. of that? And you go, oh, there's a place I could go. Yeah. And, you and for me, it's Ravel and De Debussy. Yeah, well, yeah, that's always great. Yeah. I, I'm Prokofiev to a certain uh. extent. But the same way Ravel, too, the same. And you yeah. go, oh, my God, how did they do that? Yeah. Yeah. These sort of things are kind of. Little... I keep those books on my piano okay. at all times. I got a bunch of Ravel music, I got a bunch of Debussy music, and I'm always trying to play them badly. You know, like not yeah, trying yeah. to play them badly, no, but, but just, you know, playing them badly. But, but just to find how this happened and what this movement was. Well, and you know what it's like, it. too. Yeah. You, you get tired of yourself. Oh, yeah, very easily. Right? Like you always go to the. No, oh, yeah, that's yeah, not. Yeah. Really? Am I going to go there again, that yeah. same place I go all the time? So yeah, you go to your favorites and you go, well, I would never have thought of going there yeah. in a million years, right? Well, another side of what you do is, is music director. Yeah. Okay, uh, Rock of Fame show. Yeah. I remember seeing the ending of this. Right. The finale. Right. You're standing on stage with all these dignitaries from the music world. That's right. Conducting, and you look like you were losing it. <laughs> I, I was blissing out because it was yeah, sounding you good, you know. We did, uh, I did two shows last year at, at Massey Hall. I did uh, the Canadian Songwriters Hall of Fame where we inducted David Foster, Alanis Morissette, Brian Adams, and I'm going to forget one person. I'm so sorry. I can't yeah. remember who it was. And then uh, more recently, we did the, uh, uh, the Rock of Fame show where we inducted 13 Canadian rock bands from the 60s and the 70s. And uh, so, yeah, I was musical director for both shows. So I have, a, I have an extended house band, which is maybe a 10-piece house right. band. And we back everybody up. Now, do you stress out over this stuff? Yeah, that's, so that's pretty stressful. The only thing that's more stressful than doing a, a, a music-centered show like these shows, because it's, it's all music, right? right? The only thing that's more stressful than that, and that is my years in my years in the early 2000s doing the Gemini's and the Genie Awards. Okay. So that's live to live television, not live to tape, because this all, all this stuff is live to it's an audience. Yeah. But this stuff is live to air, which means you got the headset on and the, the director's yakking in your ear and, and the stage director is counting you down at a commercial and going into commercial. And so everything is timed to the half second. So not only do I have to get everybody rolling and watch what's going on on stage, and it's like the, the, the music better be a done deal because the logistics of the job are what's going to be the challenge. If, yeah. if, if you're worried about the music, then you weren't thinking about timing, which is good. Like it, it's like Ricky Minor doing American Idol. Yeah. Like that's oh, live to air. Yes. Right? And that is Precise. the most stressful. So this is next where I've got 13 different artists performing with, with my uh, house band. Right. So that goes back to a little bit about being a shrink a little bit because there are people that are freaked out, people that right. go out of their, their, they aren't used to not playing with their own bands. Like for example, um, we got Serena Ryder to sing You Ought to Know for Alanis Morissette who's sitting in the front row. I gotcha. She called me, she said, Lou, she said, I, I don't think I can do it. Yeah. She said, I'm freaking out. She said, she's my idol. She says, when I was 13 years old, when that record came out, I used to perform barefoot in my bedroom in front of a full-length mirror, performing You Ought to Know and dreaming I was at Massey Hall. 
He says, I don't know if I can do it for, for real. And I said, Serena, the only way to do this is to put yourself back in that moment. Come, come out with no shoes on and think of that mirror and put yourself in your bedroom and do it just like you used yeah, to do it in your bedroom. Fun. Afterwards, she thanks me. She said, thank you for saying that. <laughs> Otherwise, I would have exploded with fear doing it for Alanis. So there's that whole aspect yeah. of it, too. Yeah. Lou, it's been great. There's so much more to talk <laughs> about, know, Bill. Bro. We just got started. <laughs> the espresso hasn't worn off yet. <laughs> no, this is great. And, it, and it's great to be here at the Red Whip because we hang out here. I love it here. Yeah, yeah. we're here. And yeah. Anyway, this has been Conversations in All Keys with Bill King and my very special guest, Luke Monte. Thanks again. Thanks, Luke. brother. Yeah.